John 16. I want to continue to talk about the Holy Spirit as the, uh, the governor of the kingdom. Um, so in John chapter 16, and again, for years I didn't understand this passage like, uh, like I do now. And I've been on a journey of revelation for about 15 years about the kingdom. All right? So um, I'm trying to give you, in a short period of time, stuff that has taken 15 years to distill in my heart and to develop in my thinking and for revelation to come on revelation on revelation until, until I've got a picture. And I still don't have it all. Um, you know, because um, God's a limitless God. So the understanding of the kingdom is limitless. Amen. All right. So John chapter 16 and um, verse 7. I tell you the truth. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now, it's sad that they used words like helper and comforter because um, the word really, from my perspective, is the word means the initiator. It's the one who comes alongside to help us, so they use the word help. In helping us, he brings comfort, but that's not his primary role. He's the initiator. Right? The Holy Spirit is the initiator of kingdom things. If he's the governor, he's the initiator. He's going to hear from heaven, yeah, the government of, of, of the, the home country, and he's going to tell us what the king wants so that we can administer and advance his kingdom the way he wants it. So it's to our advantage that Jesus went back to heaven because then he would send the initiator, the governor, uh, who would then actually lead and guide us into all truth. What truth? Not just how to interpret the Bible correctly, but the truth of the kingdom, the truth of what God's purposes are so that we can be led by the Spirit to fulfill those purposes. All right. In verse 8, And when he has come, you will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, we've uh, had a lot of talk in the church, particularly Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, about conviction of sin. I want you to notice something here. It doesn't say he will convict the church. Does it say that in your Bible? He will convict the church? No. No. See, the Holy Spirit's job is not to convict the church. If we are the ecclesia, we do not need conviction, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. True? Yeah. If we are the ecclesia, the Senate, we, we are not bound by sin. We do not fall into temptation to sin. We do not need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So, why do we hear about the fact that people say things like, Oh, you know, we need the Holy Spirit to bring conviction of sin into the church. It's because the church is not the church as it's supposed to be. If we understand who we are in the kingdom, as, as the, the, uh, the, the, the senate of the king, those who rule and reign with him in this life and advance his kingdom under the direction of the governor, then we are going to live free of sin. True? Old things are gone, new things have come. Conversion means that we do not sin. Yeah? Yes, we're still growing. We're still go, uh, progressing towards maturity. But we should not need the conviction of sin in the church. Yeah. <laughs> now, I can see people's minds, you know, people kind of thinking, you know. But do you agree with me? Yeah. Yeah. See, there's something wrong with the church if we think that we need the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin in the church. It means the church is not what it's called to be. It says he will convict the world. But here's the other thing. We talk about the conviction of sin, but we don't talk about the conviction of righteousness, and we don't talk about the conviction of judgment. Do you know why? Because we haven't got a kingdom perspective. When you have a kingdom perspective, then you understand the role of the governor of the, the kingdom, which is the Holy Spirit, and it is to convict, but he's going to convict the world because he's going to be working through us because he's within us. He comes upon us. He walks with us. Isn't that what Jesus said? Yeah. Yeah, he said all those things. And so if he is within us and he comes upon us and he's with us, then everywhere we go, the governor of the kingdom is there. How do we know that? Because the kingdom is in us too, yeah. so therefore the governor yeah. is in us. Yeah? yeah? And so everywhere we go, if we are truly uh, kingdom people, if we're the ecclesia ruling and reigning over our own lives and, and in, in the things of this life and the things of the kingdom with our king, then we're going to find that the Holy Spirit is going to convict people around about us. 
But his job is not to convict the church, it's to convict the world. The church is not supposed to need convicting. <laughs> Alright? Did you get that or do you want me to go some more? Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah? Alright. So here's the thing, he then explains it. He says, now, this, this work of the governor of the kingdom in the world, right, to the world, he convicts of sin because they do not believe in him. See, the conviction of the Holy Spirit to do with sin can't happen in the church because we, we believe in him. So we have actually used the concept wrongly, but also it's because the church is out of order and hasn't got the kingdom uh, context and is not expressing the kingdom. Right? So, the conviction of sin comes upon people who don't believe in Jesus. Why? So that they will come to faith in Christ. So the governor of the kingdom is the key to the advancement of the kingdom into our world. Right? Because he's going to convict people of sin and bring them to the place of faith in Christ. This is why we need the Holy Spirit. Because every, and I'm not talking about preaching here. I'm not talking about evangelist work here. You know, I'm talking about kingdom people. Right? And the church as the ecclesia. You know? and, and our local church, if it becomes uh, you know, an ecclesia right, of the kingdom, then wherever we go, we know the kingdom's in us. We also know the governor of the kingdom is within us and comes upon us and walks with us. So therefore, wherever we go, we are going to influence people and the governor of the kingdom is going to influence people about the things of the kingdom. So then the things that are not of the kingdom in their lives are going to be confronted by the governor of the kingdom and they will, will come under the conviction. What does conviction mean? If you're convicted in a court of law, it means that you have been found to be guilty. Right? So the conviction of the Holy Spirit is that the governor of the kingdom makes people realize that they have come into contact with the kingdom and they are guilty of not surrendering to the, and to the king and giving their allegiance to his authority. Yeah? yeah? So if we want to talk about the Holy Spirit's role in the kingdom, it's not to make us feel good. It's not so that we can go, oh, I feel the presence of God. It's not just so that we can you know, move a bit here and there in the gifts of the Spirit or you know, something like that. Do you know, the, the role of the governor of the kingdom is... Because he's in us, wherever we go, therefore there is a confrontation. There's a clash of kingdoms. And the very governor of this kingdom, who is part of the Godhead, is in us. And he will want to confront the things that are not of the kingdom of God in other people's lives. That's the conviction of sin. But the purpose is to bring people to faith in Christ. So they will actually then repent because the kingdom has come near them and they will want to enter into the kingdom. So the governor of the kingdom is the key to the advancement of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. How are we going? Yeah? yeah? You thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Getting into your spirit? Yeah. Good. You're going to need about a month to process this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, conviction of righteousness. Conviction of righteousness. And Jesus says, because if I go to my Father and you see me no more, Righteousness is God's right order, or the right order according to God. So, a conviction of righteousness. This means that, um, you know, it, it, Jesus says, well, I'm not going to be here to keep you on the right track. But the governor of the kingdom is going to be here, and he's going to um, cause you to know you're guilty of transgressing, transgressing when you are no, no longer have things in God's right order. <laughs> right? And so, uh, you know the concept of um, you know, someone looking over your shoulder all the time. That's a, uh, an expression in, in, in Australia. You know, I, I don't, you know, well, we need someone to be looking over our shoulder. It means I need someone close who's going to keep me on track all the time. Jesus was saying, I'm not going to be here to keep you on track. Right? And I'm not going to be here to advance the kingdom myself. But I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He is the governor of the colony earth on behalf of the government of heaven, right, to use that terminology. And he will actually, because he's going to be in you, wherever you go, he's going to confront things that are out of God's order. 
because I won't be here to do what Jesus is saying. So do you know what the, the, um, the, the, the kingdom does? It actually exposes disorder. It exposes sin and unrighteousness. It exposes disorder. It exposes it. And of course, because the church is out of order, it exposes it there. You know, the Holy Spirit exposes it there. But also, it, if, uh, if we are going to be kingdom people and be a genuine expression of the kingdom, then our lives are going to mean that wherever we go, there's going to be stuff that's out of, out, out of God's kingdom order that will get exposed. And we need to be prepared for that. And, and be able to actually you know, have a word of wisdom or something like that and have discernment and, and be able to speak the truth of God into situations so that they will come into God's kingdom order. Yeah? Do you know, we had an election here um, this year and there was a landslide victory you know, to the, the conservative parties. And, um, but you know, last year, I, I actually contacted a, a couple of Christians that I know in the conservative parties uh, to try and speak to them because I could see that things were out of order in their, in their conservative political parties. And the word that God had for me to give them was that there were certain things they had to get in order if they were going to win the election. But you see, they didn't understand because they hadn't got a kingdom mindset. But fortunately, those things did come into order because the, the political parties actually got a new leader and he brought order. You know? So God had his way anyway. But here's the thing. If the governor of the Holy Spirit is in us and we are listening to his voice, we're being led by the Spirit and we're walking in the Spirit, which you know, Paul tells us that, that we must do, otherwise we're going to walk in the flesh. You know? So if we're kingdom people, we're going to walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit and, and be led by the Spirit. Amen? So then he's going to help us to know how to bring order in our world. <clears throat> See, this is part of the process of changing colony earth to look like the home country. Yeah? At every level. Political, in the education system, the health sector, industry, business, social welfare, whatever. The governor of the kingdom is here and he's in us, and through us, he wants to actually um, expose disorder and give us the keys to bring in water. Amen? Number three, in, 11, in verse 11, conviction of judgment because of the rule of this world is already judged. You see, this is about the kingdom. But without a kingdom understanding, we have not, not seen what it really means. See, Jesus isn't talking about a helper who's going to make us feel good and life's going to be easy because we've got a, a helper. You know, he's not talking about a houseboy. You know? <laughs> he's not talking about a maid servant or something. So, so the English Bible is very is terrible when it comes to understanding the kingdom. He's actually talking about the governor of the kingdom, to use my terminology, the initiator of kingdom purposes, and that he lives in us and he's going to reveal the king's purposes to us. And because he's in us, then sin is going to be confronted and people will have an opportunity to put their faith in, in the king and come into the kingdom. Things that are out of order will be exposed and we will have the Holy Spirit's strategies to bring order in the world, not in the church. Yes, in the church, but beyond the church. If, if we're going to colonize planet Earth on behalf of the government of heaven, then... We need the governor of the Holy Spirit to lead us because what we're reading about here is what he does in the world. So to advance the kingdom, to conquer new territory, and to rule over it, and to change it to look like heaven, we need the governor's help. In fact, we can't do it without him. He's going to be the one who leads us and initiates things and gives us the strategies to change political things, to change things in, the, in, the, in bureaucracy in our nations to change things in all the different public service sectors and, 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 um, you know, and, and every area of our society, and in business and industry and everything. Amen? In the arts, you name it. And um, so then judgment is talking about the kingdom. I'll tell you why. Because the rule of this world is already judged. You know, I started out, beginning of last session, I mentioned about, um, uh, you know, Revelation 12. Uh, 11, yeah, 12, sorry. There was war in heaven. What happened? Lucifer was judged. He was cast out of heaven. He was cast to the earth. Do you know what it says there? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because he has come down to you. But the Bible doesn't say woe to kingdom people. <laughs> because 
Jesus has triumphed over the devil. Amen? He has all rule and all authority. The devil has been judged and sentenced, but not yet sent to the prison. So he is still active, but he knows his end will come. Yeah? And he has already been judged, which means that we have every confidence. But not only that, this is our message. You see, the Holy Spirit as the governor of the kingdom. It helps us in advancing and ministering the kingdom by convincing people that they can live free of the judgment of the enemy. They can live free of the bondage of the enemy. They can live in victory over his works in their lives. They do not have to come under that. They can actually be delivered from that and they can learn to rule and reign in this life because the ruler of this world has already been judged. And Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has the authority and power. And the enemy who has influenced their lives for so long doesn't have to influence their lives anymore. You see, this, this is the conviction of judgment for the world, not the church. You know, I hear people say, oh, you know, judgment begins in the house of God. God needs to judge his church. And, you know, and, and there's a true principle there, except that's not God's first aim. God loves first. He doesn't judge first. He extends mercy and grace first. He doesn't judge first. You know, Jesus could have come to judge the world, but instead he came that the world might be saved. That's the mercy and grace of God. In Titus 3, it says, you know, the love and kindness of God is, of our God has appeared. And by his mercy we've been saved. By his grace we've been justified. And therefore we become joint heirs with him. Part of the ecclesia. <coughs> joint heirs. Yeah, see? So the Holy Spirit as the governor of the kingdom, his job being in us is to give us God's revelation, the king's instructions, kingdom strategies, um, and his influence through our lives is going to impact the world we live in. So if, if we are going to colonize this planet, just like, you know, because if the church is apostolic, that is our job. And it is. The early church was called the apostolic church. The ones who had a mission. What was their mission? The same as the apostles that out of the ecclesia that um, Caesar sent to rule and reign over a territory and to change it to look like Rome. The church's job is not to have big buildings and you know and large numbers and all that. All of that's good, I'm not putting that down, right? But that's not the primary focus. Though. You see, Paul said, I have planted, Paulus watered, God gave the increase. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All the things that others are seeking will be added. We have pursued the byproducts and wondered why we haven't got the right outcomes. True? Mm. You know, what's the Western church about now? It's about wealth, prosperity, reputation, comfortable lifestyle, having everything easy. That's what the Gentiles see. So the Western church primarily is seeking what the Gentiles are seeking. So they are seeking the things that Jesus said would automatically be added. Because we haven't honored the, the Holy Spirit as the governor of the kingdom, therefore we're not listening to him. If we were listening to him, we'd be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and knowing that all these things that our world is seeking are simply going to be there for us. Yep. Yeah. Yeah which we were talking about in the break. Yeah. But you see, it requires faith to do that. And while ever we are chasing all the things that Jesus said would be added, that means we don't have faith in Him. It means we're, we're trying to make it happen. And we're using the Scripture to try and bend God's arm, say, come on, God, do it for me, you know? <laughs> True? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah. You know, God's spoken to us that we're going to have a church property. We look at all kinds of properties and whatever. We have no money to buy one, but that's okay. Because God knows what He's doing. One day, somehow, God's going to, it'll be the right time and God will give us the right strategy and the right property will be ours. But if we, if we pursue a property and do all the things that we think we're supposed to do, you know, do, do all kinds of fundraising events and do all kinds of things and da 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 you know what we're doing? We're saying, well, God, we don't actually trust you to lead us. We're saying to the Holy Spirit, look, we don't actually trust you as the governor of the kingdom. 
We, we know we can raise money this way, then the banks will listen to us and give us a loan and we can build a property. So what are we doing? We're pursuing the things that the Gentiles pursue. We're doing a man's way. But if, we, but if the Holy Spirit says, do these fundraising events, that's a different story. If it's part of the governor's strategy, then that's a different story because it's about obedience to him because he represents the government of heaven. So it's like the king himself speaking to us. It's like the, our heavenly father himself speaking to us. Amen? So then the Holy Spirit's role is to speak to us on behalf of the Father and on behalf of Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us that He will reveal Christ to us, reveal Jesus to us. That if we know Him, we'll know the Father. You know? Why? Because He's the governor, He's the true representative of, of, of the Godhead to us here on earth. And His job is to help us and to initiate and to lead us in administering and advancing the Kingdom of God. Because He knows heaven's strategy for the advancement and administration of the kingdom. And it's not the denominational way. And it's not according to man's principles. He has all kinds of different ideas and they require faith and they will manifest in the supernatural. And in fact, I'm getting to the stage, I must say, where I think if I don't see the supernatural, I start to wonder if God's in it. <laughs> because the kingdom of God is a supernatural kingdom. We say it's a spiritual kingdom, but that doesn't have the same impact on our, our thinking or on our hearers. It's a supernatural kingdom. Heaven is a supernatural place, true? God is a supernatural God. His kingdom is a supernatural kingdom. If we are kingdom people, we are supernatural people. Why, why is the Holy Spirit the governor? Because He's a supernatural being and He does supernatural things. Conversion is a supernatural transit, you know, uh, change in person's life. True? It's supernatural. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a supernatural thing in people's lives. Speaking in tongues is supernatural. Yeah. Healing is supernatural. The way our finances function is supernatural, what it's supposed to be. Yeah. Man, come on. It's supernatural. And we get so locked into the natural thinking. Man, if we understand who we are, we're the ecclesia of the King of Kings. So therefore, if His kingdom is supernatural, then we should be expecting the supernatural, walking in it, letting the Holy Spirit lead us in it. We should be moving in you know, words of wisdom and words of knowledge and the prophetic and, and have discernment and insight. And, you know, we should be doing works of power and seeing all kinds of supernatural thing, uh, things happen around our lives and in our churches and in our ministries. Amen? It should be, that's the zone we're supposed to live in. Because the Holy Spirit, the governor of the kingdom, indwells us. And we've got to learn to let him loose so that supernatural stuff happens wherever we are. This kingdom's not going to be advanced because we have big numbers in our churches. In fact, it's been proven. I think I said the other day about this. It's been proven that it doesn't work. We don't change our cities by having mega churches. We change our cities by the power of God. Amen. Amen. We do. Yeah. That's how we, ch we change our nations. Not by having, you know, thousands of churches in our denominations. That doesn't mean anything. Look at the United States. There are thousands of denominations, and many of those denominations have thousands of churches, they have thousands of mega churches, and the country is still going down the toilet. <laughs> Come on, let's be honest about this. It is. Their, their president is reported today as saying that yes, we should allow gays to marry. The country is going down the toilet. Yeah. And yet, they've got the biggest churches, they've got the biggest denominations, they've got the biggest of everything in the United States. And sadly, churches by their thousands in countries around the world are looking to a nation like that and saying, if only they would help us. If only they would pour their money in here. I want to tell you something. You don't need their money. You don't need their help. You need the kingdom perspective. You need the power of God. You need the work of the Holy Ghost in your life. You need the supernatural power of the King of Kings in your life and in your ministry. And if we break out of where we've been found and get released into the kingdom, I want to tell you something. We're going to see something far greater than any nation on earth. That's right. Yep. Yep. That's it. Yep. And God's doing it outside of the West more than He is in the West. Do you know why? Because they've said, hey, what we've been taught has got more to do with the things of man than the things of God. And those that have broken away, you know, had a mindset change and broken away, you know, from, from what they were taught, you know, the colonised nations and, and the missionaries. And look, I'm not putting missionaries down. My parents are missionaries. They did a fantastic work. But 
they could only minister in the light that they had in their time. And if, and if nations, the churches and nations are going to continue in that light, they're going to miss the best God has. Because God's moved on. Come on. Yeah. God's moved on. Yeah. And I'm so glad that you, you guys are here. I'm, there's a part of me that, that wishes, I mean, I don't know how we would have coped if everybody had come. There was about 120 who wanted to come from other <laughs> nations. But we trust God. You know, somehow... God would have opened doors, you know. Yeah. But I want to tell you something. I'm so glad that God allowed you guys to, to get here. Because I trust that out of this you'll go back to your nations and, and, and things will change. Amen. Not just a new fad or something in your church. I'm not talking about that. This is not a conference you come to and get a few new ideas and go back and change everything and hope it works. <laughs> this is about a new foundation. And it's about the restoration of what Jesus came to do originally. And God's now restoring. Amen. Amen. So I want to tell you something. Throw out all your Western thinking that might have been built into your mind. You don't need it. And this is a Western man telling you that. <laughs> Throw it out. Repent of it. Ask God to deliver you the, the thinking that's been built into you by the West. Because this wasn't written by Western people. This was written by Eastern people. But we've interpreted it through a Western mindset. Yeah. And mostly it's been wrong. Our interpretation. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else I can smash? Come on. <laughs> I, I hope you can hear my heart. Yeah. I'm not just against things. I, I'm so passionate about us removing the obstacles so that we can move into kingdom purposes. Yes, Amen. Right. Become kingdom people. Mm. Yes. And yes. see the kingdom of God advance. Yeah. yeah. And, and see our cities and nations change. Because mm, yeah. that's what we're called to be. The church has always been called to that. You know why we went through the dark ages? Because we lost the kingdom. Do you know how we lost the kingdom? In the third century, the emperor decided that after three centuries of trying to persecute the church and not making any change to their power and their authority, if you can't beat them, you join them. You neutralize them by legalizing them. So he legalized Christianity and made it the religion of the empire. So then everyone in the empire was a Christian. So, so he becomes king instead of Jesus. There's no more need for repentance because everyone's a Christian. No more need for faith because the, the, the emperor looks after you. And the list goes on. In the third century, the church lost the kings. That's why it degenerated into the dark ages where there was no light and no revelations. And where the, you know, the, uh, the Church of Rome uh, functioned in evil ways. They sold eternity to people. They sold indulgences. People had to pay to try and secure a place in, in heaven. What a tragedy. How dark those centuries were. And then God began to restore. From around the 1500s, you know, uh, Luther and others, and bit by bit there's been a restoration of different parts until we get to the last century and God poured out His Spirit in a number of places like that, Pentecost again at the start of the, of the 1900s. So it was like a whole new Pentecost. And then He began to restore um, the, uh, you know, the firefold. You know, the, the, the great teachers began to go around the world teaching. The great evangelists, you know, began to go around the world. And then of course, later in the century He began to restore the, the role of the prophet. And then, of course, the, the, the Apostle. And then he's begun to restore our understanding of the Kingdom as well. And so what's he doing? He's now accelerating the restoration of his original plan. And it's time we came out of the dark ages of our denominationalism, our religiosity, our institutionalization, and, 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 and our selfishness, and our pride, and all those things. It's time we lay all those things down. We've got set free of them and come into what the Kingdom is about and let the government of the Kingdom lead and guide us. Amen? And let him work through us and so that things get changed and things get exposed and we can lay a new foundation and see the kingdom of God dominate on this planet. Amen. <laughs> Alright. Now, if he's the governor of the kingdom, you know, here in Australia we're we're actually we were a colony of Britain. We're now an independent nation, but the Queen of England is still our queen. Um, which means that Australia has a government. But every state in Australia 
also has a state government. Right? Here's the thing. The governor of Queensland only has authority in Queensland. The governor of New South Wales only has authority in New South Wales. If the governor of Queensland goes to Sydney, she has no authority there because she's the governor of Queensland. So her authority is over the sphere that she has been given by the governor of Australia. Okay? Now I talked about the Roman Empire and how the Caesar had his senate, his ecclesia, people called out of society to rule and reign with, you know, rule the empire with him. Out of the senate he would send governors, uh, apostles, to rule over territories on his behalf and to change them to be like Rome. So I want to talk about apostles now. Apostles are like the, the governor of Queensland. Apostles have a sphere of influence, but they are only have that their authority within that sphere. So the word apostle is not a title. And if a person is an apostle, they don't have apostolic authority everywhere. Only in the sphere that God's given them. Now we've had a, a problem with the restoration of, of apostles to, the, to the, the church around the world from this point of view. Firstly, apostle has been used as a title. So therefore, I must be honoured and revered because I'm apostle so-and-so. No. Apostles are the foundation. Chris talked about this. Um, it says that um, you know, Paul said, I planted and he said, I've laid the foundation and nobody else should lay any other foundation than the one I've laid. He was a foundation layer. Ephesians 2.20, that's in the first chapter of Corinthians. Ephesians 2.20, he says, um, uh, you know, the, the church is built, the, the, Christ, the king, is the chief cornerstone and the, church, the foundation is the apostles and prophets. Okay? So we lay foundation. That's what apostles do. But he, the thing about... Well, excuse me. The thing about this is that um, when, when uh, Caesar sent apostles to an area, their role was to govern. Okay? So when Jesus called his apostles, his disciples to himself, and then called them apostles, he was signaling a shift. They were no longer students of the kingdom, they were now training to be governors of the kingdom. Yeah? But they, they could only govern in the sphere that he gave them. So initially, the 12 apostles of the Lamb governed in Jerusalem and from Jerusalem. Then, of course, um, many, many years later, some of them went, they all went different directions. The apostle Thomas went to India. And he was martyred in southern India, outside uh, in Bangalore. No, um, Chennai, Chennai, that's right, Chennai. Chennai. Um, do you know that southern India is different from northern India because he went there and that was his sphere of apostolic grace and authority and influence? Wow. It is. It's different, eh? Southern India is different from northern India. Um, you know, others went different directions. So eventually they, they governed the church and its expansion from Jerusalem, but then eventually the Holy Spirit sent them to different parts of the world as well. And they advanced the kingdom with their apostolic grace. What were they doing? The Holy Spirit was saying, you need to go to this area and conquer it and then rule over it and begin to change it. Yeah? Now we see that the Apostle Paul, he went uh, uh, on his missionary journeys, and it sounds good when we call them missionary journeys, because we think, well, there's, more, there's been missionaries for centuries, and well, the Apostle Paul's a missionary, and he went on his journeys, and, and we bring it down to just you know, any kind of missionary activity. No. He was an Apostle. And as such, he went on a specific mission for the king. And his job was to go and conquer territory and rule over it and change it to be like the king. So when he, and we see it in Acts 13, let's go to Acts 13. It says that the church at Ant that was Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas Simeon, who was called Elijah Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Why did the Holy Spirit say? He's the governor of the kingdom, he initiates kingdom 
purposes. He initiates kingdom's activity. He initiates kingdom expansion. Amen? The Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. What was the work? We know that Saul was called by the Holy Spirit when he had his Damascus Road experience and in the three days of blindness afterwards, he was called to go to the Gentiles. True? Yeah. So God actually called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. What was his sphere of influence? It was the Gentiles. When Paul went to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, he was there not an apostle of authority over Jerusalem. You read in, in the book of Acts, you'll find that when Paul went to Jerusalem, he didn't go there as an apostle to Jerusalem. He went there and submitted himself to the apostles of Jerusalem. I think it's Acts 15 or something like that. Because Paul was not, he didn't have apostolic authority in Jerusalem, he had apostolic authority to the Gentiles. Because that's the sphere God had given him. Do you know, um, some years ago, when God began to speak to me about this, I was asked by an apostle who's, who I know to go to the country that he has great influence in and to, to, to uh, do conferences there for him. So, uh, so I went. And uh, God was talking to me about this stuff. And I, and I began to realise that I was going to a country which was not my sphere. It was my friend's sphere. Yeah. So I had no authority there. You see, just because you have a calling doesn't mean you have authority everywhere. Whereas in so many countries, you know, if I put the word pastor in front of my name, all of a sudden people have a different attitude towards me. That's not the kingdom. You see, I only have authority as an apostle in the sphere that God's given me. Everywhere else I need to submit to whatever authority is there. So, the very first morning of this, um, this round table conference we were doing, I mean, we've got apostles and you know, all kinds of people there, and the, you know, the tables are all set out in this big building, and, and, um, and uh, I'm introduced, and the guy who introduced me you know, said a lot of nice words and so on, and, and, um, and, and when they gave me the microphone, the very first thing I said was, um, well, after saying, you know, thank you, and it's nice to be here, and so on, I said, the first thing I want to say is this, I have no authority here today. The room went quiet, people are looking at each other, they start talking to each other. <laughs> I could see the consternation on their faces, they're thinking, what is this guy talking about? You know? I said, the reason I have authority, I don't have authority here today is because this is not my sphere of influence. Yes, I'm called because I've been introduced as an apostle. I said, but I'm not an apostle to you. Which was true. I was not their apostle. So I did not have authority over them. <laughs> and so I explained this to them. And um, I think it's in Corinthians 11, if we can go there. Um, let me just see if I can find it. I have, just to explain to you, I had some notes prepared, which I'll probably do the next session. But I really thought God spoke to me to give this overview, which I'm giving now. Uh, and so I, um, I'm just doing this out of my heart, out of my spirit, because I've, I've spoken to so many conferences about this stuff. Um, but I just really felt God wanted me to um, give you an overview. It must be 2 Corinthians 11. Or 10. Which is the chapter where he talks about our weapons of warfare and not carnal? 2 Corinthians 10, yes. Okay. You see, in this chapter he's talking about apostolic authority. Alright? This is not about the believer's authority. This is about apostolic authority. And I think we have actually led a lot of um, vulnerable Christians into a place where they have come under great demonic counterattack because we have told them this chapter is for them. Yeah. But this chapter, Paul is not saying that this kind of, you know, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty in God to pull down strongholds and all these things. He's not telling the Corinthian church that that's their authority. He's talking about his apostolic authority and he's saying, we. Huh? And so we need to be very careful how we you know, teach people out of the, the scripture because we can tell them they've got authority that they don't have or we can encourage them to function in ways that they haven't yet learned how to or haven't yet grown in, into authority and in rank them yet. 
Yeah? And as a result, they, we put them in danger spiritually. So he's talking about his. He says, I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness in Christ. I beg you, verse 2, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. And of course, the issue with the Corinthians was they, they said things like, well, he's just a short man, he's not imposed, physically imposing, and you know, he's not a big man. I mean, who is he? You know? And he's saying, well, it's not about the fleshly thing, it's about the fact that God's given me this authority. Uh -huh. Then, of course, he says, verse 4, the weapons of our warfare. He talks about them, about casting down things and so on. And, and then he says, um, verse 8, even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us, you see, he's talking about his authority, the apostolic authority of him and his team. The Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction. I shall not be ashamed lest I seem to terrify you by letters. And then he goes down and he says, verse 12, we did not class ourselves or compare ourselves. All right, so, you know, this is not about competitiveness. It's not about comparisons between us. We are all called to a destiny in God ourselves, and we're all equal before God. We should not be comparing ourselves with one another, and we shouldn't be commending ourselves or promoting ourselves to one another. All right? Um, we should, it says they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves among themselves. Man, the church is full of this stuff. And Paul's saying it's not to be in the kingdom. And, and particularly with apostolic authority, this is not how it is. And then he goes on and he says, We, however, will not boast beyond measure, beyond our allotment or our sphere. Okay? But within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you, What's he saying? He's saying, well, I have authority to actually pull down strongholds and wrong thinking and, you know, and whatever, and, and subject things that are not of God underneath the Lordship of Christ because you guys are in my sphere of apostolic authority. So therefore, under God, I have a responsibility and a right to do this. Right? Now, Matthew 16, um, Caesarea Philippi. Philip the Tetrarch was the apostle, and that's the Roman word, over Caesarea Philippi and the surrounding region, the region of. That was his sphere of authority. Now you look at when um, uh, Jesus came up before Pilate and Herod. Two different rulers with two different spheres. And one said, I don't want to deal with this. Maybe I'll send it over to so-and-so. Maybe... With his authority in his sphere, he might be better dealing with this. You see, the Roman Empire was very clear about who ruled what sphere. So again, the Holy Spirit is the governor of the kingdom. Apostles are the human governors under the Holy Spirit. They govern the kingdom, but they govern the sphere that God has given them. How do, how do we know the sphere? Sometimes God will call a person to a nation. You know that nation is your sphere. But it's not just geographical. In, in the kingdom of God, it's relational. And Paul said to the Corinthian church um, that he was their apostle because he had begotten them. But he was not an apostle to others because he had not begotten them. All right? So here's the thing. Our sphere is firstly revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. If we're, uh, if we're called to be an apostle, right? And so this is how I understand uh, coming under an apostle and working with an apostolic grace. We need to understand this stuff. Because the kingdom is um, administered and, and advanced under the leadership of the governor, the Holy Spirit, but primarily through apostles, because they are the ones who, who lead the church and uh, to govern the church. Now, in the past for so long, We've had other you know, leaders and administrators and pastors and so on leading the church. And we haven't recognized apostles. But now God's causing us to understand and to recognize apostles. But we need to understand how this works so that we can learn how to come in, be a part of the sphere of an apostle and come under their grace and under their authority so that they can govern and help us to advance the kingdom and help us to fulfill our destiny in the kingdom together. Amen? So then, um, what does begotten mean? It means giving birth to. Now this has been interpreted just as, well, I led you to Christ. It's not, not just that. 
you know that um, there are people who are uh, ministries that are in my sphere that have been ministering for a long time, but something of the kingdom has been birthed in them through my, my ministry and my grace. See, it's about a birthing. Right? And Paul said, uh, said, you know, that, um, that he had begotten them. And so therefore, he had a, a responsibility to them as an apostle, which is the, a human governor of the kingdom under the leading of the Holy Spirit, who is the governor from heaven. Amen? So it's like the governor of Australia and the state governors. The Holy Spirit is like the governor, and apostles are like the state governors. They each have their sphere. It doesn't have to be geographical. Some, it's, um, some people are apostles over a city. Some are apostles over a nation. Some are apostles over multiple nations. Some are apostles over, over certain types of ministries in different nations, you know. But um, you can recognize the grace of an apostle. The reason I use the word grace is, in Romans 1.5, Paul says to the Roman church, we have received this, great, this grace and apostleship. Right? So it's a grace. And there's grace attached to the apostolic calling. And without the grace, the apostolic calling can, can become very uh, uh, dictatorial. But the grace of an apostle means there is authority, but there's compassion. And I'll talk about that later. I'm going to get off on track if I keep going down there. All right, so, so if we want to use this concept of, of um, colonization, right, then we, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is the governor of planet Earth. Apostles are um, uh, appointed by him under, the, you know, under Christ, the king, because it says in Ephesians 4 that Christ gave his gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So the government of heaven, the king, told the governor of, of colony earth, right, add these people as governors over spheres of the kingdom. Yeah? That's really, add them to the, to the ecclesia and, and give them a sphere of governing influence for the sake of the king. So, so to use the terminology, I thought, hopefully that helps you to understand the picture, yeah? So apostles don't just have title apostles, so therefore they're a big man everywhere. No. That's, that's not biblical at all. all right? um, so it's not a title. It's a function. And it's a, there's a grace attached, which is so important. But the function and the authority is only within the God-given sphere. See, if we go on further, um, Paul says in verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 10, we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority does not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel, not boasting of things beyond measure. So he's talking about, I'm not going to boast beyond my sphere. Alright? Um, this is verse 15. That is in another man's labors. In other words, I'm not going to build on another man's foundation. He says that somewhere else. Right? He says, my job is to lay foundation and to, to raise up others to build on that foundation and to take heed how they build, as he said in 1 Corinthians. And he says, I understand the limits of my sphere, and so I'm not going to go beyond it. I'm not going to try and build on another man's foundation. I'm not going to boast about you know, uh, somebody else and, and make it appear like that that's, their success is mine or any of those things. I'm not going to compare myself. I'm not going to commend or promote myself. I'm simply going to, under the uh, leading of the governor of the kingdom, the Holy Spirit, I'm simply going to do what he tells me and fulfill my calling within the sphere of gives End of story. And then he says, um, um, he says, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. So in other words, how he ministered in his sphere would add to, would, 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 um, would, would create an enlargement of his sphere. Because they would grow and mature and become bigger people. But also through them, his sphere would increase. Because he says, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. Why? Because they would actually open doors for him to actually advance the kingdom in new areas. So through the relationship that was built, because he had begotten them, and he was in covenant relationship with them, he was covering them, right? and he understood that, that this isn't about being the big man, this is about flowing in the grace of his calling, and therefore he wanted to pour into their lives and pour into their lives and serve them and bless them and bring them to maturity and release them in, in, you know, in kingdom purposes. And he understood that through that, that his sphere of influence would increase and God would use his investment in his sphere to then expand his sphere. 
Yeah? Now, there's a lot of talk about influence in the church today, about how to have big, bigger influence. I want to tell you something. We don't have to pursue influence, and we don't have to try and think up ways to have greater influence. If we simply are faithful and pour our lives into the sphere, the people in the sphere God's given us, God will open doors to greater influence. I can testify of that. I have not looked for influence. I, honestly, I haven't. Do you know what? Um, I spoke to you last session about Germany. And, um, you know, there was a time when I wanted to go back into Russia because we had church planting schools there. And, and, um, and of course, uh, God had opened the door for us to have, a, have the use of a, a property of eight acres and six buildings in, uh, in Ukraine for a living training school to train church planters. And, um, you know, the miracles God did was just incredible. And uh, I hadn't been for three or four years, and I, I really felt I needed to go back. And so, um, so I said to Judy, um, you know, I think we need to go back to Russia. And so we went to the travel agent and, and got them to work on the tickets. And, and we booked the tickets, and then we went to apply, apply for our visas. And uh, we couldn't get a visa. We tried time and time and time again, could not get a visa to go to Russia. I was getting very frustrated. Then one day Judy said to me, I think we should go to Germany. I said, no, I'm going to Russia. I'm not going to Germany. I don't even like Germans, you know. She's half German, by the way. <laughs> I'm such a spiritual sanctified man, aren't I? <laughs> so, a few days went by and I couldn't get this out of my mind. We need to go to Germany. So we talked about it again and I'm like, oh, I want to go to Russia. I want to go to Germany. Maybe a couple of weeks went by and finally I said to her, I think you're right, I think we need to go to Germany. So I went to the travel agent and we changed the, our tickets to fly to Germany. It cost the same amount, which was great. Uh, we discovered we didn't need a visa because we could fly to Europe and stay for three months with no visa. Um, so we go to Germany. And people started saying, uh, what are you going to do in Germany? I said, I don't know. Who are you working with in Germany? Uh, don't know. What, you don't know anyone? No, I don't know anyone in Germany. God just told us to go to Germany. <laughs> the Sunday before we flew out, the team of the church we were at laid hands on us and prayed for us and sent us to go to Germany. Right? In the service that day was a businessman from, from America. <coughs> and after the service, he came and spoke to me. He said, oh, he said, this is... He says, it's wonderful to hear that God's called you to go to Germany and, and uh, for this trip. And, you know, and he said, it was wonderful being here and seeing how they, they sent you apostolically and so on, you know, your team or whatever. He said, uh, and we talked about that, and then he said, so who are you working with in Germany? And I said, um, nobody, don't know anyone there. He said, so what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. He said, God's just told us to go to Germany. See, the fact that I'm called to be an apostle doesn't mean I have apostol apostolic authority in Germany. Something's got to happen for that to become part of my God-given sphere. Yeah? You understand? But here's what happened. That guy pulls his phone out of his pocket, this American businessman, and dialed a number and spoke to a man in Germany. Who he had met through business, but also knew to be a pastor of a church. The city that he is in is 20 minutes on the, on the freeway, on the, the autobahn, outside of the city we were flying into, outside of Frankfurt. And so suddenly, God had a connection for us. And so he said, look, this couple are coming. They've just been, I met this church in, in Australia, and they, they've just been uh, you know, sent you know, apostolically and prophetically by the team here and, you know, and, and gave him the details. So we flew in and the next morning they came to see us. And when they, they came to our hotel, they walked in, we met them in the foyer and um, uh, we greeted each other and then, then the guy said, um, so why have you come to Germany? And I said, we've come to serve you. He literally almost fell to the, the floor under the power of God. And he grabbed me again and hugged me and he laughed and he cried. He said, we have so many ministries from the West come here, from America, from Canada, from, you know, from, from Britain and so on. And I've never heard anybody say they've come to serve us. God has opened so many doors for us. 
So we have a sphere of influence in Germany because God led us to go there and God connected us with the right person and God has connected us with other people and the grace has flowed. You see, this is how the apostolic works and we're, we're helping to shift the mindsets. Here's the amazing thing. All the churches are international churches. Africans, Puerto Ricans, Brazilians, Russians, you name it. Churches from uh, people from all over the world in Frankfurt and surrounding cities that are connected to us. They're all international churches. So from that base, the influence goes out of it. <laughs> it's part of my sphere. Why? Because God led me there. He opened the door. But not only that, but something got birthed there. But then we built relationships there, and life flows through relationships. Amen? And so we're talking about the kingdom and advancing the kingdom, and about changing things to look like, you know, to, to, to be like the kingdom of God rather than like the kingdoms of this world. Then we need the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit as the governor, and we need apostles who understand their authority mm. on behalf of the king, but also the grace that yeah. they've got to flow in. Amen? Yeah. And who understand how to let God open doors so that the spheres, so that God actually gives them their spheres of influence. Yeah? And that then you go and you birth something in people's hearts. It's not about going in and starting an organization. Do you know, in Russia, there is nothing with our name on it. Nothing. And for years they didn't believe us that we didn't want to put our name on anything. Because American and British ministries were all coming in with all their money and convincing networks of churches to join them and put their name on them and you know all that kind of stuff. We went in there and started church planting schools, planted hundreds of churches, and name is not on anything. Because it's not about us starting an organization, it's about advancing the kingdom. The king's name should be on it. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. And so we're, but in Germany we've birthed something, we've built relationships. And we have a sphere of influence on behalf of the king. That's apostolic ministry. So it's not about heading up a big organization. It's not about having the, the best revelation or something. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's not about having the right connections. It's about understanding that the king of heaven came to this place called earth and established his kingdom here. And when he left, he sent his governor, the Holy Spirit, to continue the work Right? And to to, uh, to to raise up sub governors, if you will, yeah, mm -hmm. and to um, uh, to cause there to be the government of heaven seen through the work of the Holy Spirit and his and the partnership with the Holy Spirit by apostles. And the role is to not just set up bigger churches or you know bigger names or bigger organisations or any of that kind of stuff. The role is to actually birth something in the sphere of influence that God has given, birth something of the kingdom, and then build relationships that will cause others to rise up and begin to advance the kingdom. It's about multiplication. <laughs> Apostles are called to lay foundation, raise up others to build on that foundation, and train them to multiply it. You know, that's what Paul did in Ephesus. He went into the synagogue. I think uh, Chris talked about this. Went into the synagogue. He only preached two or three months. I think I talked about it on Monday. And then um, came out from there because there was opposition, went to the school of Tyrannus, taught the 12 men, 12 of them, the, uh, the number of governments, you see? Taught the 12 men, and what did he do? He established an ecclesia, and he multiplied it. The whole of Asia heard the word in two years. This is the, the pattern of the ministry of an apostle. All right? So he didn't say, oh, I set up such and such an apostolic ministry at, at Ephesus. <laughs> It was about the king and his kingdom. Amen. And it was about God opened the door. He went in, he got God's strategy. He established an ecclesia there. He, he then he burst something through that. He then ministered into that, built the relationships and life flowed. And he trained them and equipped them, which Ephesians 4 says is the first job of fivefold ministries to equip the saints of the work of the ministry. And he mobilized them to advance the kingdom under the initiative of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's how the kingdom functions. Amen.